what you have to know about vector array transducers is that they are the best for large organs and it combines a linear switched and a linear phased to the image. The vector array transducer creates this flat top with this trapezoidal or wedge shaped sector. Both steering and focusing are both electronic, which means that they're both variable. Anytime you hear the word electronic, think variable. You'll definitely have to know the advantages and disadvantages. And the advantages include, you have a wider near field of view, you have a small acoustic footprint or a small aperture. These transducers can do everything, including 3D and 4D, but the disadvantages are they are subjected to grading lobes. And these transducers are ideal for intercostal scanning. If you have a question that asks you which transducer are the best for intercostal scanning, and they don't have a linear phase, look for a vector array. This will be the second best choice. Obviously, a linear phase array would be the best for intercostal scanning, but this would be the second best. If the crystal breaks in a vector array, you're just gonna have erratic steering and focusing. Then we have a linear, sequential, or switched. Remember, you're gonna separate linear array from a phased array for just this test. One of the most important things you need to know about linear array transducers is that they are the best for small organs. When you have a sequential or a switched transducer, what it does is it will fire elements in certain groups. So they'll fire a set of 10 elements, and then the next 10, and then the following 10. Expect to get questions like this. What are the advantages and disadvantages of linear transducers? The advantages include consistent line density providing good lateral resolution in the near and far field. This is because the lines go straight down. You can see because of this rectangular shaped sector, you can see that the pulses are going straight down. The line density doesn't change in the near field nor the far field. You can kind of see how the line density will be the same, making lateral resolution good in the near field and the far field. You can have a wider field of view in the near field. This is perfect for superficial imaging, especially if you want to look at the thyroid, scrotum, breast, skin, and soft tissue. And also there's no moving parts. But the disadvantages are it has a large footprint or big aperture, and it's not the best for deep imaging. Now there's no beam steering in linear transducers. However, if you use a parallelogram, you can kind of get these slope patterns from phase delays when you have electrical spikes of the element that steer the beam. Overall, the image of the sector will be the same size of the transducer all the way down, which creates this rectangular shaped image. Now, if a crystal malfunctions, you can expect to see this vertical dropout in the same area of that crystal. Now you'll definitely have to know what improves and degrades lateral resolution. And lateral resolution is at its best when the beam width is narrow. This is known as the focus or the focal point. The beam width is what determines lateral resolution, which is determined by the diameter of the crystal. So large diameter crystals will have a narrower beam compared to a smaller crystal because Smaller crystals have lower frequencies, which means the beam diameter will be wider. You can also increase lateral resolution when you use a multifocus, when you have a high line density. The line density of a transducer is determined by the space between each pulses or between each lines and the number of lines per frame or per image. Lateral resolution is also increased when you use a linear, sequential, or switched transducer. When you use a dynamic aperture, which means the beam diameter will be wider dynamic focusing, and when you have a thin HVL or half value layer. What happens in dynamic aperture is that as the focal length increases, the aperture will increase. In this diagram, you can see that there are a number of red rectangles. Each of these represent a crystal. What happens is the aperture increases as the signals from the increasing depths are increased to maintain a constant focus. So it'll change the focal depth based on the number of crystals being used. In this diagram, the outer crystals are shut off, thus resembling a smaller crystal compared to this one when they're all combined, which will shorten the near field length or the focal depth. Then when we go to this diagram here, the second to last crystals are shut off, thus making the crystal resemble an even smaller crystal, decreasing the focal depth and the near field zone, bringing the focal point to this area. Then when we go to this diagram here, we only have three crystals remaining with the three outer crystals shut off making the combined crystals resemble an even smaller crystal, thus decreasing your focal length 
and bringing the focus or the focal point up to this area. In the beginning, we started with the focus in the far field because all the crystals were firing, resembling one large crystal with higher frequencies. Then we gradually shut out the crystals from the outside, thus bringing the focal point closer to the near field by making the remaining crystals resemble a smaller crystal with lower frequencies. And this is how you improve lateral resolution by making the beam width more narrow at various depths. With regards to dynamic frequency, you're going to have the highest frequencies or the widest bandwidth coming from the superficial region and the lowest frequencies coming from the Fraunhofer or the deeper regions. For example, if you're using a 6 MHz transducer, you'll have frequencies ranging from 7 to 8 in the superficial region, as well as frequencies ranging from 3 to 5 in the deeper regions. That means you'll have frequencies right here in the middle area, ranging around 6 MHz, and frequencies ranging from 3 to 5 in the far field. But this is how you increase lateral resolution with dynamic frequencies, because you can use higher frequencies for the near field. So in summary, what narrows the beam? Large diameter crystals, dynamic aperture. When you increase the operating frequency, you're increasing the resonation, the resonance, and the resonant. Also, a thin half value layer. But don't confuse resonation with insonation. What degrades lateral resolution is when you have a low line density, if you use low frequencies, which is accomplished when you use small diameter thick PZT crystals, fewer focus when you increase the depth, and when you have a thick HVL or half value layer. You could probably also say that when you decrease depth, this will improve lateral resolution. When you look at this transducer here, you can see why lateral resolution is at its worst in the far field or the Fraunhofer zone, because the line density increases in distance the further away it moves away. That means lateral resolution is gonna be really poor here compared to here. But line density here is going to be great all the way down because the, distance, because the distance between the lines doesn't change in the near field nor the far field. Regarding convex transducers, your test may not distinguish or separate sequential or switch convex transducers from convex phase transducers. But what you have to know regardless if it's a switched or a phase convex transducer is that these will have a wide acoustic aperture. The sector will be blunted. You can see how this aperture is curved, causing this top of the sector to be blunted or arced. The advantage of these transducers is that you have a wider field of view in the near field, and you have good temporal resolution and frame rate. The best transducer with the widest near field is the endocavity probe. The second best is a convex, curvilinear, or curved. And the third best is a vector. The disadvantages of these transducers is that it has a large aperture, the lateral and spatial resolution are degraded in the far field, it's not great for superficial imaging, and they're expensive. You could also say another advantage is they're ideal for abdominal imaging. What type of dropout or artifact will you see when a convex switched crystal breaks? You're going to have this vertical dropout. If it's a convex phased, then you'll just have erratic steering and focusing. You'll have to know the different names of these transducers, which include convex, curved, or curvilinear. And this is the same for a convex phased. Oh, okay, endocavity probe. They like these type of questions on the test. They'll say, what's the advantage of an endocavity probe? And the advantages are it provides better resolution images than transabdominal imaging because of the higher frequencies. It has an extended field of view in the near field. And remember, this is the best transducer with the widest field of view in the near field, and it also has a small footprint. But the disadvantages of this transducer is that lateral resolution decreases as depth increases, and you have a decreased field of view when you compare it to a transabdominal method using a convex transducer. You can see how wide this near field is, which is why this transducer has the best extended field view in the near field. Spatial resolution is also called detail resolution, and there are three things that determine spatial resolution. The first thing is the number of pixels, the second is the size of the pixel, and the third is the line density. Spatial resolution is improved when you use spatial compounding, fill-in interpolation, coded excitation, right magnification, high line density, more pixels or pixel density, analog converter, multifocusing, and believe it or not, decreased depth. I'm going to highlight that in red. Remember that. D 
decreased depth will increase your spatial resolution. Spatial resolution is degraded with a low line density, fewer pixels, read magnification, and increased depth. I'm going to highlight that in red. This image shows fairly good spatial resolution, where this image shows very poor spatial resolution, as you can see the pixels. When regarding the three things that determine spatial resolution, the number of pixels and spatial resolution are directly related. That means as the number of pixels go up, spatial resolution goes up. When regarding the size of the pixel, the size of the pixel and spatial resolution are inversely related. That means as the size of the pixel decreases, spatial resolution increases. When regarding line density, line density and spatial resolution are directly related. That means as line density increases, spatial resolution also increases. These images here represent two transducers with different line densities. This one here has a high line density, whereas this one has a low line density. This one here will provide really good spatial resolution as well as lateral resolution. But temporal resolution and frame rate go down. This transducer has a low line density, which means you're going to have poor lateral resolution as well as spatial resolution. But your temporal resolution and frame rate will be high. You might be required to know which areas of the beam have the highest intensity, which one has the lowest intensity, or which one has the medium intensity. And if they showed a transducer like this with the beam, they ask you, click in the area or label the area with the highest intensity. And the highest intensity is gonna be right there in the middle. Then the medium intensity is gonna be right here, right in this region. And the lowest intensity will be all of this region here. 